peace to you in the name of the risen Lord. And welcome to worship with the First Presbyterian Church of Cranberry. My name is Pastor Hannah, and I am so grateful to be with you in worship in this time. The announcements of our church life together run on slides at the end of this worship video, and so I invite you to worship with us through to the end so that you can see what's going on in our church life and think about how you might be called to be involved. Today is the second Sunday in our Spring Fourth in Faith worship series, and today we are talking about our shared value of community building. Following worship, we will have an opportunity to fellowship with one another on Zoom and to continue the conversation about community building, the conversation that will be started in worship. This Zoom link is the same link we use for coffee hour every week, but if you are in need of it, please just drop a line in the chat of whatever platform you're worshiping with us on, and we will make sure someone gets it to you. Next Sunday, the Buildings and Grounds Committee invites individuals and pods and families to join them for our spring workday from 12 to 2 on April 25th. They have um, projects all around the campus, indoors and outdoors, set aside for you to help them with. So come wearing comfortable clothes and a mask, and we will find a COVID safe way for you to help spruce up our campus that all will be ready for our eventual return to in-person services and activities. Now friends, let us go to God in a time of worship, praying that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we would be made one and that God would transform our hearts and minds so that we don't leave this time of worship the same way we came in. Let us worship God. Please join me in the call to worship. Easter people, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. God is calling us to watch for the risen Christ, bursting in with new life and new hope. Here we are, a community of faith, seeking strength to live out our lives courageously, faithfully, and triumphantly as we strive to follow Jesus. We celebrate the riches of your grace, O oh God, by seeking to embody a community of believers deeply rooted in the truth. We come with anticipation for all that lies ahead at home, at church, and in our community. Touch us this day, O oh Lord, that we might become your people, your body, your children, and your church. In praise and thanksgiving, let us worship God.
family of faith, resting in the love of Jesus Christ, please join me in the prayer of confession. What love have you given us, O God, that we should be called your children? What love have you given us, O Christ, that we should share a table with you? Forgive us when we act as if we were your only children, when we do not recognize your image in the faces of strangers, enemies, or friends, when we do not share our own tables, forgetting that we need each other. Forgive us when we treat others as worthless or unwanted. Mold us into a community where all your children are accepted, included, and loved. Forgive us, O oh God, and call us back into relationship with you and equip us for relationships of integrity in our families, in our church community, and in the world you love. We pray this in the name of our risen Lord. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. We are forgiven and free. Alleluia. Amen. Christ be with you. Over to you, Loida. Hi, peace of Christ be with you all. And over to you, Jody. Peace of Christ be with you. Peace of Christ be with you, Carlene. Thanks, Jody. Peace of Christ be with everyone. And peace of Christ be with Pastor Hannah. Peace of Christ be with you all. Our scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. Please listen for the word of God. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous people who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Yeah. 
Please join your hearts with mine in prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Today is the second Sunday in the Vision Team sermon series, and we will be speaking about community building. We're gonna start with an old cartoon from Joe McKeever which shows a lakefront shop named Anglin Sam's that rents rowboats labeled Little Green Chapels. Out front, Anglin Sam himself is holding one of his green rowboats upright. Its stern is resting on the ground and its bow is pointing upward toward the sky. In that position, the boat does look a bit like the arch of a chapel. And Sam is explaining to a potential customer that the boats are for those who prefer to do their worshiping on the lake. The cartoon, of course, is a pot shot at the explanations that people sometimes give for spending Sunday mornings fishing, golfing, going out for a leisurely breakfast, or even sleeping in instead of attending worship. The heart of that argument is, I don't need to go to church because I can worship God anywhere by myself. We should remind ourselves that these other activities also place fewer demands on us than coming to church. No one will pass offering plates. No one will ask questions about how to address the world's hunger problems. And no one will tell us that we must repent and believe in the gospel. All of these reasons about why we should attend church have validity. Pastors have a vested interest, not only in the survival of the churches that we serve, but also in their growth. So we get worried when attendance drops off. In that case, and that is the case in many places across America, our arguments about why people should attend church can sound self-serving. We attend church because we need community. We need what many people call our church family. It's better to remember that we all benefit from participation in our church life. A faith community provides instruction and support, feedback and accountability, and it brings order to our lives. Attending worship is an important way of putting the events of our lives in helpful perspective. 
There's an old illustration about a longtime church member who had always regularly attended, but then suddenly stopped coming. After a few weeks, the pastor decided that he'd better make a visit. He went to the man's home and found him alone, sitting in front of a blazing fire. The parishioner invited the pastor in and directed him to a comfortable chair near the fire. After an initial greeting, the two sat in silence, watching the roaring fire dance over those logs. Then the pastor took the fire tongs and picked up a brightly burning ember, which he placed on the side of the hearth by itself. That lone ember's flame began to flicker and eventually died. Soon it was a cold gray coal with no life or warmth. Then the pastor picked up the coal with the tongs and placed it back into the middle of the fire. Within seconds, it began to glow with light and warmth, ignited by the flames around it. As the pastor rose to leave, the parishioner said, thank you for the sermon, pastor. I'll be back in church next Sunday. We don't know if that incident ever really happened, but the truth it presents is plain enough. Our individual faith gives off more light and warmth when a community of kindred believers support it. So we participate in church because it satisfies our need for community. And as we move on to how and why we build communities, let's remember too that nowhere in the scripture does God say go to church every Sunday. The Bible has lots of texts where God tells the Israelites to worship him. And in the fourth commandment, God says to us, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. But Sabbath keeping is something larger than attendance at a public worship service. It's the devotion of a whole day every week to God and to the life of the spirit to remind us of our covenant with God. The closest reference to a command to attend Christian worship comes from the writer of the Hebrews, who said this, and let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, and this is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. Taken together, all of these things give us a biblical basis, not only for attending worship, but for participating in the life of the church and for building a community within the church. The Good Shepherd wants us with the flock, not apart from it. So let's go back to the parable that we just heard from the gospel reading about the lost sheep. The shepherd has 100 sheep, but when one of those sheep wanders off, the shepherd leaves the 99, presumably somewhere safe, and searches for the lost one until he finds it. And when he does, he brings it back to the flock and then asks his friends and neighbors to rejoice with him. According to the text, Jesus told this parable in response to some Pharisees and scribes who were grumbling because Jesus was welcoming known sinners to listen to him. And what does he do when the sheep wanders off? He hunts it down and brings it back to the flock. While finding the sheep, was of some benefit to the shepherd, it was of even more benefit to the sheep. What can we draw from this parable about God's perspective on our church community, on our flock? Perhaps the main reason can be that the flock itself is the church community, simply because that's the place in which the divine shepherd drags wandering sheep as a church family, we should understand why some members leave this flock. We should continue to bless them on their journey, but we should also try to think outside the box so that we can see what others see when they stay and when they leave. Because it's a parable, if the wayward sheep represents us, there are human applications. Yet the only one that Jesus makes is that the return of the sheep to the flock qualifies as repentance. And maybe that's the point. Although we can enumerate benefits of our faith from being unchurched, the main reason for being here 
isn't for the benefits, but it's because where God wants us to be. Shepherds do go out after strays, but most of the work that the shepherds do with the sheep is while they're in the flock together. And most congregational flocks are nourishing locations where God works with us. We can talk about why we should attend church in terms of the church's survival or of the benefits that we receive from being here, but isn't it enough to notice that when we wander off and Jesus comes looking for us, he will likely push us toward a flock, toward a community, toward a place of safety, sustenance, and nurture. We need to work continuously to be a loving, welcoming community where people feel like they're part of the family, despite any differences that we may have. Richard Rohr in Yes and Daily Meditations says this, spirituality creates willing people who let go of their need to be first, to be right, to be saved, to be superior, and to define themselves as better than other people. This congregation, this family of faith will keep the doors of the church open so all are welcome. Every pastor understands that in a real sense, there's always a perfect time for us to discuss with our congregations why we gather together as a church community and how we build these communities. So we offer in the Visions Team sermon series discussions on the core values of this community. The Vision Team is helping us to focus on the strategic targets and goals which are based on our core values. As we talk about community building, we should remember this, that we are called to foster a culture of openness and tolerance within our church community, to embrace our differences so that we can enthusiastically trust God's plan for us. The scripture that they included from Isaiah was, do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? In my experience here, hospitality was one of the ways that this congregation anticipates who we might meet in the course of our own journeys as we extend friendship and solidarity and we welcome others, they may be drawn to our community of faith. But for some, it may be a challenge because it's hard to make changes in our lives, but hospitality and sincere greetings are a wonderful way to draw members into our community. I was raised Catholic and I attended mass every week with some frustrations. I read the Bible very often and never understood all of the things we were doing that were not in the Bible. I was working with a Presbyterian elder, Bob White, and we had our own Bible studies every day at lunchtime. He told me that if I visited a Presbyterian church, I would find all the things I liked about being a Catholic and none of the things I didn't like. The very next Sunday, I went to a local church with my visitor name tag on, and yet, during the sign of peace, not one person came up and spoke to me. I realized I was as I was leaving that I didn't know what I was looking for, but this was not it. The next week, after calling here to Cranberry, we had two worship services then, and I called because it said Bible study before the second worship. There were about six people in Fellowship Hall when I came in, and they all stopped talking. They introduced themselves to me and asked how I, they could help me. And I told them I was looking for the Bible study, and they said, which one? Wow, I was stunned. But there was the start of a new member class. So they walked me to the library, introduced me to Reverend Tisdale, and the rest, as they say, is history. I remember one of those classes downstairs, and I was sitting next to another new member who was also raised Catholic, Scott Kerr. And we were sharing a Bible during those classes, and when it was over, we had questions for Reverend Tisdale. And the first thing we asked him is, what do we call you? And he said, Al, you just call me Al. And I remember Al, Scott and I looking at each other like, Al, just the first name? 
those journeys here and the welcome did not change for either one of us. There is such a sense of openness and enthusiasm and a sense of purpose here. For community building, the vision team said this, we value developing authentic relationships within the congregation that permit bridge building across generations and phrases of life that create appreciation of life experiences and different points of view. They also added this scripture. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individual members of it. As a community of the body of Christ, we need to remember, as Jesus did, the divine worth of each and every individual. The parables explain why people gravitated to Jesus, because he looked for them. And when he found them, he rejoiced that they were with him and he was with them. As a community of faith, we should be gravitating toward one another within our congregation. There should be no division between genders or ages, understandings or beliefs. As a family of faith, we should love and respect one another, agreeing to disagree on a variety of things. Christian evangelist Rick Warren says this, always encourage people to embrace their fellow Christians. Warren reminds them to work together towards common goals. Success is never a one man job. It takes teamwork, he said. And there are so many examples of the many ways that this congregation works together as a team in building a community amongst ourselves with intergenerational confirmand mentors, our senior care baskets, Thanksgiving baskets, Skeet's pantry, we could go on and on. Every Sunday, we celebrate what we have done as a community and how we did it. And we should continue to remember this during our transition. This church is still on the journey that's in the continuation of everything that Jesus began to do and teach a journey that is still unfolding. During this time of transition, we remain focused on our core values. We continue to trust in God and one another as we build a strong community that focuses on the plans that God has for us as a church. We are a flexible congregation with a sense of openness, enthusiasm, and a renewable sense of purpose. May it be so. Amen. I invite you to join your voice with mine as we read together the affirmation of faith using the words on the screen before you. We believe in God, the creator, who has shown a light since the beginning, a light that leads us forward in faith. God's presence feels like home and we strive for all to feel at home here, counted as family, known, welcomed, and belonging. We give God thanks and praise through worship, prayer, scripture, music, and service, and offer our whole lives to God for God's good purposes. We believe in Jesus Christ, our Savior, who commands, love as I have loved. We follow Christ in love of God and neighbor, and we pray for Christ's character of love and passion for justice. We celebrate the fellowship of Christ and seek to build a community of Christ followers that all would be honored, nurtured, and provoked to love and good deeds. We believe in God's Holy Spirit, the paraclete and advocate. We believe God's Spirit is working in, through, and on us, that by the grace of God we might proclaim the good news, celebrate the gifts and diversity of all, and trust God's plan for us with all joy, gratitude, and hope. We believe, Lord, may it be so. Amen.
As we gather together as one family of faith from a distance during this worship service, please join me in prayer during this time of offering. Creator God, we come to you today with open hearts and with open palms. Mold us into instruments for your love in the world. Nudge us towards greater generosity and creativity and curiosity. We long to make your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. It's Pastor Hannah, and I just wanted to take a minute in worship to recognize our seminary intern, Alyssa Mitchell. Alyssa, thank you. This is Alyssa's last Sunday with us as a seminary intern, so I invite all of you to take a moment to drop a line in the chat of whichever platform you're worshiping on or to reach out to Alyssa personally and to share your thanks and gratitude with her. Alyssa taught confirmation this year. She led worship weekly in whatever form worshiping was happening. She supported our Christian Ed and Youth Committee, and she supported our, our Congregational Life Committee. She's learned more and more what it means to be Presbyterian, and in addition to all of that, she's worked with Urban Promise Trenton, providing four hours of academic support and curric curriculum writing for Urban Promise Trenton, our ministry partner. We are so grateful to have spent this year with you, Alyssa, and we can't wait to see what God has in store for you next. Thank you. Please join your hearts with mine in prayer. Light of the world, we come forth from the darkness into a new dawn. With the dawning of your sun, we sing forth your praises. For now the earth has a savior, a Christ. Grant us wisdom and grant us courage to follow him faithfully through the trials of doubt, through the times of persecution and testing. Even as our Savior leads us, we know that he brings the goodness and the blessing of God to each one of us every day for new birth, for new life. And as we take that path into final glory, we give our thanks to you. Most loving and inviting God, you have gathered us here together in a community that shares tears and joy, struggles and hopes. From the beginning, you said that it isn't good for us to try to go through life alone. And so at creation, you gave us partners so that we may journey together. Today, we gather together as a community of faith and we journey together, sharing our faith, our joys and our concerns. We hold one another up when times are hard and celebrate when times are good. Together, we share a bond, a commitment, and a purpose that makes us stronger. For all these things and many more, we give you thanks, O Lord, our Redeemer, our Healer, and our Creator, praying together the words that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, life is too short and too hard to try to make it alone. But thanks be to God, we aren't alone. God will never forsake us or leave us and God has placed us here in this community of faith, surrounded by a family who loves us and cares for us, a family of faith 
on whom we can fully rely. When times are tough, they are here. So let us go forth as people of faith who know from where their help comes. In the name of the Father, our Creator, the Son, our Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit, our Sustainer. Amen.